Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual Veteran Entrepreneur Training Symposium webinar series hosted by the National Veteran Small Business Coalition. I'm Earl Morgan, Program Director for the NVSBC. The NVSBC is the nation's largest nonprofit trade association representing veterans and service disabled veteran owned small businesses in the federal marketplace as prime and subcontractors. We appreciate you joining us today. First, we'd like to thank our sponsors who made this webinar series possible. MiraCorp, Raytheon Technologies, Penn Bay Media, Associated Veterans, Metros and Edwards, and Tevit. On behalf of the board of directors and members of the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, we thank you. This webinar is approximately an hour and 15 minutes and is being recorded. During the webinar, if you have any questions, please submit them to scott.denniston at nvsbc.org. We will try to get to all your questions on this webinar. And if you by chance we miss your question or do not have time to answer it, we'll get the answers and post it on the virtual VETS 20 webpage. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, the executive director of the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, Mr. Scott Denniston. Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you, Earl. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on where you are to, uh, to our audience. And uh, I want a, a special thank you to Earl Morgan for all the work that he's put into putting the, the webinar series together. You know, we were extremely disappointed when we had to cancel uh, Vets 20 in San Antonio last month because it was such a great event in May of 2019. And we were really looking forward to bringing everybody just a tremendous um, lineup of speakers on topics that were incredibly relevant to uh, to what we're all about trying to help veterans be successful in the federal marketplace as prime and subcontractors and one of the gentlemen that i had the pleasure of meeting um last fall actually um at an event um who was a 20-year uh, marine corps veteran um and now serves as the administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Dr. Michael Wooten. When I met him, I said to myself, gee, we've, we've got to get him as our keynote in San Antonio. The guy has a tremendous message, um, committed to improving federal contracting, ensuring that there's opportunities um, for small businesses. So uh, we're thrilled that he's with us today as our, our kickoff speaker for this series. And, I'm only sorry that you can't all have an opportunity to, to meet him in person. Um, as I said, he's a 20 year Marine Corps veteran, has lived in uh, Northern Virginia, been very active in the Prince William County Public Schools and the Northern Virginia Community College Board. He holds an associate's degree from Georgia Perimeter College, bachelor's degree in psychology from Chapman University, master's degree from Norwich University, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School and the George Washington University and a doctorate in higher education from the University of Pennsylvania. Before Dr. Wooten uh, joined the administration, he was the Deputy Chief Procurement Officer for the District of Columbia, responsible for a over $5 billion budget and 166 government procurement officials. So he knows what it's like to be in the trenches. Prior to becoming the administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, he was the acting assistant secretary and deputy assistant secretary of the Department of Education, Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. He's a lifelong supporter of academics, particularly from a community standpoint. He was very active with uh, Defense, Acquisition, Defense Acquisition University, and so just a perfect person for uh, the job as the administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, which, as most of you know, is part of the ex executive office of the president is responsible for total oversight of federal contracting. So, Dr. Wooten, thank you, sir, for, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, before I start my remarks, just a quick check. Uh, how do you hear me? 
Very well, thank you. Great, great. So again, uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, even though I am present virtually, um, I want you all to know that I'm with you. Uh, and that message needs to come through loud and clear. Scott, thank you for those gracious remarks. Uh, you are correct, I am a Marine veteran, uh, having served 20 years for as an enlisted Marine in air traffic control, uh, the last 16 as an officer. The last five years of my service, I served as a contracting officer, having graduated from the Naval Postgraduate School. So that is basically how I cut my teeth in uh, this community. But I do want to add, uh, while I served for 20 years as a Marine, I am a uh, proud holder of a legacy of over 75 years of naval service. Uh, when you count myself, my father, my father-in-law, and his father. So um, veteran uh, is, is something that I didn't understand growing up because uh, that's it, it's similar to the fish not knowing that he is in war. That has been that has been my existence. Um, I, I want to further add, though, that my both my father and my father-in-law uh, both ran uh, small businesses. So I do understand. Um, I could go on about policies, and we will have fruitful discussions where you have concerns or questions. But I also understand that you all, as small business owners, really need to understand uh, what, what the opportunities are because you have the continuous need to make payroll and to continue to function. So I wanted to hit a couple of the treetops. I want to talk about what's happened and what I think is going to happen and where that might present opportunities or where I suspect you might not want to chase an opportunity because the door may be closing or may have already closed. So as you know, um, when you first started thinking about this particular conference and the webinar and the keynote, the world was different. By about February, we started realizing that the world would be different. And by March, we were shutting in, hungering down, and quarantined. So now we're in the world of COVID. And so I want to talk about the opportunities presented by COVID and some of the other things that have come along beyond, behind COVID. COVID, um, Section 3610, something different, Section 889, uh, Workforce 2025, and uh, Rethinking Cost Reimbursement Contracts. Those are the things I want to talk about, where I think opportunities might um, be impacted. So let's start with COVID. For now, I think COVID has become an old news story. If you're not already in the game, don't, rate, don't waste your resources. A, a, a lot of the larger suppliers are up and running. A lot of smaller businesses or maybe even mid-sized businesses have figured out how to get viable pipelines. And they're connecting both to the feds and the states. I was fortunate enough to be able to help some of the states connect to uh, opportunities to be able to get those critical uh, supply items, such as the M95 masks and the ventilators. I still get calls from time to time from small businesses wanting to know how to get in the game. And if you're thinking about getting in the game now, you're a bit behind. I think that's an important uh, message to convey. It might not be good news, but it's necessary news. You need to understand that if you're not already in the game, the ship has probably sailed, that there is, uh, there are brighter opportunities in other seas. 3610, what is that about? Uh, most of you probably already know, but for, for the person listening who might not uh, understand 3610, 3610 basically refers to Section 3610 of the CARES Act of 2020. And the CARES Act, uh, was was uh, passed uh, early this year and was designed to keep the economy functioning and had a number of uh, relief provisions in it to include 
uh, expanding unemployment, um, allowing businesses to stay open um, by, uh, well, supporting uh, businesses staying open by uh, offering loans. Uh, and, an, and another thing that it did was it empowered the federal government under se Section 3610, it empowered the federal government to continue paying businesses that uh, that had contracts but were not able to perform because the government made decisions to close. So under 3610, um, we, we put out some initial guidance and the coordination has been uh, challenging because everybody needs to be able to weigh in and uh, let us know what they think the right answer is. Uh, we have a set of FAQs, over two dozen I believe, and because we had such a large package of responses, the coordination has been very, very long and has strained the patience of people who need to hear that guidance. But that guidance will come out shortly. In a week or so, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm tired of promising because I said a week or so, probably two months ago. But 3610 will tell you, um, this, or rather our 3610 guidance, particularly our frequently asked questions section, will tell you uh, how we will implement uh, the the uh, mandates put forth in Section 3610 of the CARES Act, and specifically, it's designed to address what uh, guidance we've given contracting officers in providing relief to businesses and small businesses. So, um, moving on from 3610 and moving from the topic of COVID. Um, Section 889, and, and, uh, and of course, I'm referring to Section 889, Part B of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019. I believe it's 2019 and not 18. Don't quote me. Um, Section 889, Part A was implemented last year, and basically, it barred, it barred uh, the federal contracting offices from doing business with um, five contractors out of China, Huawei and four other actors. Uh, this was to safeguard uh, the, the US from any uh, unnecessary uh, IT intrusion and also safeguard us against the theft of intellectual property. Part B requires far more stringent um, safeguards. So Part A was implemented in August of 13, 2019. Part B will go into effect August 13, 2020. There is where I believe an opportunity lies. For many, you're going to deal with the initial challenge, making sure that you don't have one of those five contractors, we refer to them as covered contractors. You wanna make sure that they're nowhere in your inventory. Let me say that again. You want to make sure that they are nowhere in your inventory. If they are and you have business with the government, you're going to have to seek a waiver. We're getting guidance out here um, very, very soon. But the again, the thing that you want to make sure is that you don't have covered contractors in your inventory. When I say in your inventory, I mean even if you are providing um, chewing gum to the federal government, even if it were chewing gum, and chewing gum obviously is not IT. Still, if in the back office you have uh, equipment that has um, Huawei or other, uh, other covered contractors uh, involved or touching your, your IT system, that is something that is potentially impacted by uh, Part B provisions. We are looking to write those regulations so that we put some common sense into it. But there will be um, a, a lot of interpretation. Uh, there, and because of the various interpretation, there will be variance in the ways that agencies uh, try to implement uh, Part B of Section 889. And my my um, my counsel to you is make sure that you understand it first. Now to the opportunity. 
I see a significant opportunity for small businesses who are well positioned to be able to track inventory, understand IT, understand how to mitigate the risk of uh, of, of cyber um, of, of, of cyber snooping, I, I'll, I'll say, um, or, or other cyber crimes of uh, the theft of intellectual property. Those companies that have those skills have a huge opportunity in the new 889 Part B environment. So let me say that again. I believe that the opportunity is really strong with small businesses who have cyber risk mitigation capabilities or inventory tracking capabilities and where they have both of those and other related capabilities in their portfolio, I think they can bring significant value to, uh, to, to the defense and industrial complex, particularly in business to business transactions, helping businesses get the, the, the covered contracts out of their inventory so that they're free and clear to do business with the federal government. So I think that's a huge opportunity uh, right now. And as you know, by the time things get very, very public and everybody's talking about it, you're already behind the curve because the businesses happen to get inside the, the, the big businesses will often get inside the decision loop and they will muscle you out. So you, you're hearing from me, I think this is still a viable opportunity that I hope many of you and, and many uh, veteran-owned small businesses can uh, can take advantage of. Moving further into the future, Workforce 2025. I know this opportunity is in your lane, and I want to tell you what the vision is for Workforce 2025. First, I'll tell you this. The vision of Workforce 2025 tells you that we're looking at a change in the workforce in less than five years. It tells, it, it's communicating to you that we see changes in our workforce, not just acquisition, but other related and similar uh, workforce uh, structures. We see those changes coming in short spurts because automation is, is developing significantly in short periods of time. In 2025, I believe that more of our workforce will be using robotics process automation to handle the routine and mundane tasks. For example, compliance checks. It can be done by process automation. In fact, any process that can be performed by a set of programmable or flow chartable, if I can use that term, processes where there is a clear step and a clear right or wrong answer. If I can flowchart it, then I can program software to perform that task, and it will be faster and more accurate than the human being. And where we can do that, we can gain efficiencies in our workforce and relieve people of mundane tasks and free them for the tasks suited to college-educated professionals so that they can, do, they can now apply their skills in professional judgment and let robotics process automation assist them in the other areas, other necessary areas like compliance checks. The other area besides RPA, where we, we believe there will be opportunity is in artificial intelligence. And I'm talking about the, the less defined, more uh, human-like uh, cognitive cognitive functions that come from automation. For example, when I'm writing an email now, there, is, uh, there, there are um, apps or pieces of software that will assist me in finishing my sentence. It used to be that only my wife could do that. Now, there's software that can do that, assist me in finishing my sentence. I found in the last month or so, that that software is even uh, even available or even involved in assisting me 
in writing my email. So I can be typing up an email and now software jumps in and has suggestions for where I, how I might want to write my email. That same type of software, that, that level of artificial intelligence also has suggestions on what type of jazz music I might want to listen to when I use Pandora. It comes up with similar uh, items that I might uh, consider of interest. And likewise, I know that th there are uh, there are marketing applications that use the same type of AI, where they suggest that you buy some things that are similar to the other things that you've demonstrated in your buying pattern because they use available data. So in Workforce 2025, I believe that artificial intelligence will be assisting our contracting officers, helping them understand the the significant data that we've collected through uh, through uh, category management and helping them with buying decisions it will also help the larger acquisition community in shaping requirements documents it will have the smart suggestion the smart way forward in shaping performance work statements and statements of work that i believe can happen within the next five years and if you have the capability to roll out either robotics process automation or the more sophisticated artificial intelligence uh, services, then that's a huge area of opportunity. And it doesn't just stop with the acquisition or the contracting community. There, there are applications that you can see for many different professions that, uh, that, that are particularly reliant on processes to complete their work. Another area that, uh, and, and this will be my, my final one, another area that I think um, perhaps uh, will lead to opportunities uh, is in our rethinking how we employ or how much we employ cost reimbursement contracts. Now, I will tell you this, I am getting out in front of my skis. I am, kind of asking for you all to serve as thinking partners. I am talking about an idea, not a commitment, not a policy decision, but an idea. And I would like to get your feedback because I want to know how the idea might impact small businesses. I think the idea might impact small businesses favorably, but this is the idea. Oftentimes where we use cost reimbursement contracts, the private sector might use time and material. And we could do the same thing. We could do more of the same. I think it would, it would uh, uh, remove barriers to entry for small businesses, particularly where we're using cost reimbursement contracts for um, innovation, research, and development, places where small businesses might tend to shine. But small businesses often don't have uh, the cost accounting standard uh, accepted systems to enter into cost reimbursement contracts. So when they serve as subs, what do they do? They often sub with time and materials contracts anyway. And I think uh, if agencies would consider more TNM contracts, I believe that would be helpful. Now, I taught cost and price analysis at DAU and I'm willing to try a few things. And one idea that I'm floating is using time and materials contracts, but, but with a twist, where, where I have um, discussed my requirements with potential offerors. And, the, and, uh, we, and I've shared clearly the effort involved. We can come up with a target effort and a target cost, just like with cost reimbursement contracts, but with a twist. Instead of all of the machinations that go into operating cost reimbursement type contracts, the only thing that I would borrow from that is where there is an underrun. Look at uh, look look at providing um, um, a, a a larger 
a percentage of whatever the billable rate is. And where there is an overrun, the government asking for a discount on the billable rate. Now, in a competitive environment, you would you would be asked to consider how much you can discount your billable rate to land the contract. But being in control of your offer, don't expect your best contractor win. I suspect that the way a lot of billable rates are structured, the discount may be very small. In other words, less than 5%, often maybe even less than 3%. But with, with that, that approach, uh, that is one way of, the, uh, of, of having the government uh, address concerns that cost reimbursement contracts have become wasteful. And I think with this particular approach, it, op it removes barriers to, um, to, to entry and allows small businesses to belly up and consider going after some of the uh, innovation contracts where they could uh, serve best. So again, I'll leave you with the question. I'm wondering how that particular crazy idea might impact small businesses. And at this point, let me stop for questions. I yield. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um... That was uh, that was a fire hose. Actually, it's more like bigger <laughs> balls, but we appreciate it. So, so let me um, let's go back to COVID um, for a minute because one of the things that we're seeing is on the hill there is a huge push to bring manufacturing of critical items back to the United States, and so from our perspective, the issue becomes one of for a small business, what would what would be the investment required? What incentives would there be, and how would we ensure a uh, a guarantee, not a guarantee, but a, a committed market? Um, because most of the the pieces of legislation that we're looking at um, will require DoD and the VA um, as examples to buy only American-made products. Um, and the just knowing how the government operates, you can have a, any business, not just small, who makes the investment, sets that up, um, and obviously there's still issues with the uh, um, the raw materials and, and where we get them and the definitions of manufacturers and all these other kind of internal things to the government that, that we deal with every day. Um, but but one of the, the real issues is, okay, so DOD or VA will pay a premium to get a, a domestic product right now, but two, three years down the road when COVID hopefully goes away and the budgetary pressures are such that it's in the world where we are now where best value equals lowest price and the government traditionally in medical products doesn't commit volume, what assurances would there be or could you see from a government perspective that would make a, a, a particularly a small business willing to make the investment necessary to establish a manufacturing um, operation here in the States? That's a great question. Um, so let's, let's pick that question apart in, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, don't let me forget to come back to um, the question of policy assurances, because okay. uh, I, I want to address that as well. But to start off with, you started the question with, in the co with the phrase in the COVID environment. And my initial, my initial talk uh, was couched this way. If you're looking at COVID, I think you're already I think you're already behind on the opportunity. And certainly, as you fleshed out in your question, the peak market for COVID is obviously going to be when uh, and for and for the critical supply items that are sold to mitigate COVID. The peak market for those is going to be the next year or so. Right. And then after that, you expect the market for those critical supply items to recede to normal. Well. Uh, who you, you're thinking about the risk that you have to, that you're going to take if you decide to um, uh, onshore 
those uh, the, the manufacturing capability to make M95 uh, ventilators, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, now for the M95, I think it's 3M is one of the large manufacturers. It doesn't take much for them to ramp up and then ramp back a bit. Um, so I would, if I were playing chess in my mind, I would think I would expect them to do just that. And one way they can ramp up without uh, putting up a lot of cost is just uh, hire people on a bunch of ships and run the machinery in the ground. And they don't have to put up a whole lot of uh, um, uh, cost for inventory uh, just for the raw materials, but they don't have to buy machinery. Uh, and they can ramp up and, and take up a lot of that space and then ramp back. And so it's very little risk to them. For a small who's not in the game, though, you've got to go out and get the machinery, um, and, and you have to make that decision: do I do I really want to do that? Uh, particularly if you don't have the policy assurances that um, that uh, you're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, that you're going to uh, have the opportunity to sell your goods down the line. Now, the way you get the policy assurance, of course, is not necessarily through a policy assurance, although you might be able to get a a, a uh, member of Congress to earmark something for your business, uh, but that happens a lot less frequently these days. What uh, your best assurance is the land of contract, saying you will you you can provide for X number of years, but you've got to have the investment already made, the site up and running, the land, the contract. And uh, I again, I I don't know that that's the best way forward for. A small veteran. Now that that uh, a very, rather small veteran veteran owned business. Um, that being said, uh, there may be other areas um, uh, outside of COVID where you find it's ideal to um, to pursue manufacturing. Much of the stuff that is being manufactured by the covered companies, Huawei, etc., that we're getting offshore you're going to find it harder to get those. There may be an opportunity. Manufacturing the things that were uh, manufactured or that are being manufactured by Huawei, because essentially what uh, Section 889 does is it divides the world into you, 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 you buy from Huawei or you don't. If you buy from Huawei, uh, then, then the U.S. isn't likely to do the U.S. government that is, isn't likely to do business with you at all. So th that, I think, that policy can potentially create a niche for small businesses. Okay, okay. Because yeah, we've got a number of small businesses um, looking at that manufacturing of the, the PPE stuff, and it, it, it just doesn't seem any, any way that it's, it's realistic for a small business to make that investment without knowing um, what the, the future is going to be from a marketing standpoint. It's a it's a tough tough question. Yeah, um, and, and again, uh, my crystal ball isn't that good. I don't know. Uh, we could all be we could all as citizens be very very unlucky and see a series of pandemics. That's not in my crystal ball. If that happens. You know, uh, then, then the businesses who have invest, invested in COVID are going to make a lot of money. God forbid. But I, I don't think that's likely. And uh, and so investing in something that's that has a, a, a clear invisible spike in demand, a spike that will recede, um, I, it, it comes with inherent risk. I know a lot of small businesses are trying to do um, pass-through work, and that's coming up. That's coming with risk too. That is, they try to secure the uh, critical supply items and then resell them to the many uh, state, federal agencies, and uh, private hospitals that require those goods. But uh, again, when the demand recedes. Uh, they will they will be out of that business, but the smalls who are doing the pass through work w at least won't be saddled with a lot of manufacturing equipment. The challenge right. the challenge is though 
for at, at present, more and more states are saying we don't want to deal with the the, the smalls or are getting the equipment as passed through. We want to deal directly with the manufacturer, and the U.S. government has its own mechanisms for doing that. We can issue rated orders that demand uh, that the uh, manufacturers give us first cut at the um, at the critical items during a nationally declared emergency. So with rated order authority, the federal government doesn't need uh, intermediaries. We can go to the manufacturer as long as as long as that manufacturer is on shore. Right. Right. Yeah. That, so some tough issues because the the one thing I think that everybody realized was that 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 the just in time distribution systems that are so popular now don't really work in these surge situations that we had with the PPE with COVID. And I think everybody's struggling to figure out what's what what's the magic formula here. Yes. So let me uh, to, to switch gears a little bit. Um, over over the years, OFPP has established their MythBusters um, program to encourage agencies to promote more dialogue with industry partners. And obviously, that's something that that, that that we love because one of the challenges that small businesses have is actually getting to the decision maker and understanding what the government requirement is. Um, unfortunately, except for a couple of and, and I'll name one, Homeland Security um, is an example. I think that uh, Soraya Carrera does a great job of dialoguing with industry and ensuring that all the components that fall under DHS do that. And there's a there's an openness there that we don't see with other agencies. What What's your experience been um, on the success of the, the Mythbusters program? Well, um... We were just talking about COVID, and of course, COVID reshuffled a lot of priorities. There were many things that uh, my office was hoping to do. Um, I came into the position on August 12th, uh, figured out where, how to get between my, my office, the men's room, and the cafeteria that week, uh, slowly climbing the learning curve. I began to understand things, what my prerogatives were, who I needed to talk to, et cetera and uh, concerns of industry and after a, a few months of that um began to uh think about things like sending out another miss busting memo by the way it's miss busting everybody calls it miss busters that's already trademarked we're miss busting um <laughs> but but uh trying to figure out what they what i might want to communicate and then came covid so uh, we haven't uh, put out this busting memos, uh, and, and I wanted, to, and, and I think it's a good idea. So I wanted to be able to continue that. But uh, and if if um, if things work as we adjust to the urgencies of both uh, COVID and then Section 889, if we're able to find breathing room to do things that are still important, even though they're not urgent then we will be able to communicate to the field with certain myth busting memos so I, I wanted you i wanted to say that i wanted you to understand that I, I believe that that particular strategy was a strong communication strategy and i believe that communication is important not just from us but also from the agency and i agree Soraya korea is one of the best in the business and uh, they do a good job of communicating and, and we're fortunate that they do because uh, DHS is one of the larger agencies and gives, uh, and, and by, by that fact, can give more opportunity. So what, the, I guess the real question is, what can we do to engage small business more? I think that's the real question. Um, and as we continue this conversation this afternoon, let's consider, let's, let's look for opportunities to um, address that question. What can the agencies do and OFPP do to engage small business more effectively in dialogue? Okay, good. Thank you for that. 
we're 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 one hundred percent behind you on that one. Um, GSA Advantage. Um, do you see that playing a bigger role in how the the government buys going forward? Okay, so one of the things that I'm probably pretty good at is admitting when I'm ignorant or stupid. Uh, you found that space. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not an expert on uh, GSA Advantage at all. Okay. Um, what not. I. What I can tell you is this: at a higher level, what I am concerned with is being able to find those tools that allow my agencies to achieve their mission by closing the time between I want a thing and I got a thing. And if GSA Advantage can help me there, then that is something that I, I, I've got to look at. Uh, I found that, uh, that, that uh, category management, for example, has done that. I found that um, looking at uh, the government commercial purchase card can do that. But I also am not so nearsighted that I look at category management and the implementation or, 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 or increased flexibilities in using the government commercial purchase card. I'm not so nearsighted in focusing on those two things that I forget the need to have a, a, a very strong and broadly participated in industrial base, meaning I, I have to be mindful of these speed to market techniques and how they impact small businesses. So uh, while I'm fessing up to ignorance on GSA Advantage, I think my answer tells you that I know what the concern is behind that. And that, that's something that we've got to be mindful of, not just with GSA Advantage, but with category management, with, with the, the government commercial purchase card, with any number of uh, initiatives that, uh, that, that people will, will, will find renewed interest in because we are now talking about a frictionless acquisition system, speeding up the time between I want and I got. So, so I got, I, I, I get that. And I think that's, that, that comes back to the other conversation that we, we've agreed to have, and that is um, how do we continue to engage small businesses and, and make sure that we engage them along the way as we look at, at faster uh, ways of, of procuring what we need. No, that, I think that would be, uh, would be great. I know that as an example, you know, we represent the, the veteran and service disabled vet community, but there's also organizations similar to ours that represent um, general small businesses, the 8A community, the hub zone community. Um, and perhaps we could, have, we could start to engage all of them um, in some discussions about um, some of these key issues. Because um, as an example, you, you mentioned the, the, the e-commerce platforms. And of course, GSA just recently announced the, the three awardees for the, the first round. And we tried, um, several years ago to work with Amazon and quite frankly Amazon is incredibly predatory when it comes to small business um, to the standpoint of once they identify who your uh, your suppliers are and who your customers are of trying to cut you out and do private branding labels and when we look at what GSA is seems to be allowing um, from the standpoint of um, pricing um, most favored customer uh, trade agreements act um, and uh, banned countries all being able to sell through these platforms. It almost seems like we, the government are setting up a, a separate procurement system without all the rules and regulations that we have to protect um, the taxpayer and the vendor community. And we're, it makes us very concerned about the future of things like the federal supply schedule system, which for a lot of a lot of small businesses have worked incredibly well over the years is a is an entry point into the federal marketplace. And we, we, we've got a lot of concerns about about how some of these new initiatives are going to impact that. 
particularly when because of the fact if you look at statistics over the, the last 10 years even though the dollars are going up to small businesses the number of discrete small businesses that are in the federal space is a less than half of what it was 10 years ago. Um, so it seems to us that the, the industrial base is going in the wrong direction from what we want as a public policy initiative. Uh, yeah, the, the data that I've seen suggests that what you said is accurate. Um, the, 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 and the, the discussion between us and SBA has been uh, from SBA, hey, um, small business opportunities are decreasing. Our defense has been, well, no, no, the dollars going to small businesses have not decreased. It's the same. But as you have teased out correctly, uh, that's because the the number of small businesses uh, has, has, in fact, uh, well, the numbers of small businesses doing business with the federal government has decreased. But the, but the dollar amount going to those remaining uh, in, in the game have increased to the point where uh, the 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 uh, the net uh, uh, the, the the net uh, cash flow to all small businesses has uh, been fairly stable. So so I and that tells me um, again uh, back to what we we talked about what you, what your message is really is um, the 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 uh, concern with how we're engaging small businesses. And now we're engaging fewer of them uh, as, as a result of uh, a, a mixture of things, policies, market shifts, et cetera. Absolutely, and, and, and one of the things that, that we preach to our folks all the time is that people who you may see as a competitor, you now must see as a teammate because as the government procurement market changes and as opportunities become larger and more complex and lasting longer periods of time, um, small businesses for the most part can't do it themselves. And we've got to get in a mindset uh, of teaming and partnering and joint venturing. And you know the, the dynamic there is most people that start small businesses do it because they're independent minded and stubborn anyway. And now we're telling them, you know, again, that person that you see, think is your uh, your competition may be your best friend, and it's uh, it's it's a challenge in our world to to get people to understand that. Of course, the beauty of the veteran world is that we we do support each other and, and we do believe in teamwork and leaving nobody behind on the battlefield, and we see business as a battlefield. And one of the things that we're most proud of is some of the the relationships that have developed amongst our members to, to develop successful teams moving forward with, with all the government agencies. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think that is, um, that is an important distinction for um, uh, veteran-owned uh, small businesses to make is that, uh, that parallel to uh, between uh, the business environment and the battlefield, uh, the ethos that comes out of uh, having been in the armed services, uh, the teammate uh, mentality, uh, the trust and confidence that you often will uh, quickly secure um, in, in potential uh, partnerships with other um, veteran-owned uh, owned businesses. I, I think those are, are strong uh, uh, values, but uh, before I yield again, let's not get off of this though. Um, I want to know how we can engage. Um, I, 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 I want to know what, what your ask is of me. And, uh, and, and, and the, the answer that I give you might be a candid, I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I have to hear the ask. I need to, I need to know what, what I can do, what you guys think I can do. We need to have that, that conversation. And that's not something that we might wrap up today. But I'm, what, what I am committing to is a, a, a continuous dialogue so that that ask can be made so that it can be sharpened and you can get to a, a question uh, where I can say yes and, and, uh, and, and get to a solution that helps you all keep payroll going. 
No, we we certainly appreciate that offer, and we'll take you up on that. And we'll we'll powwow when when we're done here, and um, I'll have I'll ask people to send in thoughts and suggestions. I've got a couple um, very specific to a, a particular agency and a program that we 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 we're fighting all the time. So I guarantee you that you will you will definitely hear from us again. Well, good. One other, one other question, um, if, if, if we can, before you leave, we know the category management um, has been a huge push the last four years. It, from where you sit, is it bringing the, the efficiencies and the economies um, to the government that, that you hoped it would? From where I sit, yes. Um, we've been able to uh, uh, get rid of redundancies. Uh, and that's been that's been helpful. Um, we've been able to develop um, in, in different categories of buys an expertise that has been important. Um, category management has laid the groundwork for uh, the data collection that we need to be on top of before we really take advantage of uh, artificial intelligence and automation. So um, I think category management uh, has been a, a very strong, um, uh, a very strong pillar for a large acquisition uh, system. So yes. Good. Thank you for that. I've been uh, getting a number of texts and emails from folks that are on the line. Um, saying how enlightening this conversation has been so i wanted you to know that before we uh we wrapped up here that it's uh there's a lot of folks that are incredibly appreciative of of you taking the time to to join us and i guarantee you once we get our plans together for vets 21 um next spring or summer um you will be on the invite list as you were this year well i appreciate that Good, good. Well, I think we're uh, we're pretty much out of time, and I'm, frankly, I'm out of questions from the group. So, uh, with that, again, thank you for your time. Um, we will look forward to continuing this dialogue, and um, feel free to reach out to us anytime we can be helpful. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, it's an honor to continue to serve those who've served us. Uh, thank you for that. Much appreciated. Thank you. God bless. And uh, y'all have a great uh, rest of your day and a great year. Thank you. You too, sir. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, with that, we will end this uh, webinar. I hope you found it beneficial. Um, comments, questions, complaints, criticisms, recommendations, please uh, email me at scott.deniston at nvsbc.org. And uh, we will look forward to continuing these every Tuesday, same time for the next couple of months. And uh, we will continue to bring you the, the best speakers we can. And uh, we hope that you find these uh, beneficial. And again, as Earl said in the beginning, thank you for your uh, to our sponsors. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. We will see you next Tuesday.